Okay, guys, we are so pumped that you're here. Me and Julie, we're so pumped. <laughs> so we appreciate you coming out on a Wednesday night. You know, you probably had other things you could have been doing, like studying, right? <laughs> All right, so Julie is, she works for Elsevier, which you guys probably recognize that name, right? That is where you log in, like, to your My Evolve Elsevier account. So she works for their company. She is an expert nurse educator, and she is here tonight to present some just general test-taking strategies. And we called it demystifying standardized testing because I've heard from many of you in this room, I just don't know how to study for HESI. Okay? So Julie's goal here tonight is to help you feel a little bit more confident going into that test because you all have one or two, three coming up in the next few weeks. So we want you to feel real excited and shoot for that, you know, thousand mark. Why not, Marty, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's welcome Julie. We're so excited she's here. Give her a warm round of applause. Okay. And I'm going to look yeah. like the soccer mom video I am with the iPad. <laughs> well, it is really good to be here. I, um, I was in a nurse faculty role for about 15 years. Sorry, I'm kind of, I want to be able to hit the microphone here. Um, and taught in a pre-licensure BSN program, much like what you guys are in, and heard from a lot of students over the years, you know, how am I going to pass this HESI exam? And I got it. Like, it's, uh, you know, it's different. Um, what kind of your first per, uh, precursor to the NCLEX, right? Um, but what I, I typically told students, you know, 90% of doing well on the standardized exam is what you're doing in class. I mean, it's, it's reading, it's engaging in the material, it's having a firm foundation of pathophysiology, um, it's coming into class, and I, I hate to sound preachy, but just, I mean, this is what works. It's having come to class with some knowledge of the material and to be able to kind of take it to a higher level in class and some application kind of activities um, and so that's you know 90% of it and then of course clinical applying it in the clinical setting going back reviewing again I mean I was in school a long time ago but I took a tape recorder <laughs> and recorded the lectures I went to the library and listened to the recording again and took more notes and I think you guys have more tools than I did when I was in school um, adaptive quizzing I think is another really good tool to prep for any kind of standardized exam. And I think you guys do use adapt some adaptive quizzing, right? Mm -hmm. So just exposure to practice questions, I think is the other part of that 10%. Um, and so you can do well. I, I don't know what adaptive quizzing you use. Is it prep? Prep, what is it? Prep you. Prep you, okay. So do you guys have different levels like a novice, intermediate kind of proficient do you have different kind of mastery levels in the yeah. quizzing yeah. Uh, so we have a similar kind of resource with Elsevier but what we tell our students is, or not students what we tell our customers is if you can get up to that intermediate level on the different RN content areas that you're prepping for so if you're getting ready to take a fundamentals exam in your adaptive quizzing product, level up at least to that intermediate or that middle level on all of the subtopics within that fundamentals. That's gonna be one of the best ways also to prep for the standardized exams. So again, it's doable. Uh, I was telling a couple of people that were here earlier, I do have a daughter who's uh, a senior in a nursing program, and so I do know <laughs> what it's like. I mean, I'm living through her now um, in terms of just how rigorous it is. and. They use actually all Elsevier products, so her and I spend time doing adaptive quizzing together. But um, I do remember how difficult it was. I was just read somewhere that a, a degree in nursing is one of the hardest degrees to get. So uh, you're definitely in, in a rigorous program and you know how much time and effort and kind of priority that it takes. So, okay. I'm not going to be able to answer everything tonight to where you guys are going to just like blow it out of the water because the bottom line is, is you've got to, you've got to know the content before you can apply anything. So, and all of the questions are at the application or higher level. So, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. What we're going to look at just for the next hour or so is I just want to show you the NCLEX test plan. If you're not familiar with it, that is a blueprint for the NCLEX and faculty use it to map their courses. Um, 
And I think it would be really helpful for you to be familiar with it as well, uh, because that's how the NCLEX is written. So we'll talk about that. And let me back up for a minute. Where are you guys in the nursing program in general? Do we have like some fundamental students, first year, whatever? Okay, so some fundamentals and then kind of some med surgery or kind of middle of the program students. And then any senior students? Okay, so we got a mix of both. All right. We're going to look just briefly at Bloom's taxonomy and where those questions, what level those questions are written at. And then we're going to talk about some different test taking strategies. Uh, for, for really faculty-made exams as well as standardized exams. And we're going to do some practice questions as we go. So for some of you guys that are in more of a fundamentals, some of the content or topics won't look all that familiar to you. That's okay. Uh, we can still get through with some of the test-taking strategies, and you may actually surprise yourself. You may actually be able to answer them without having a lot of knowledge of the actual procedure perhaps, if you know basics of things. All right, any questions so far? Anybody, you guys, so you guys have taken some standardized exams already. What, what are the most, like what, if you could sum it up, what's, what's the most frustrating, challenging, maybe it's not challenging, maybe you do find them fairly straightforward. How do you prep for them? Anybody have secrets to success in here? that you wouldn't mind sharing, rather than listening to me? Mm -hmm. Mom? We've got some in here, because there's, there's got some seniors. There's some people yeah. in here that have done fairly well on the, on the exams. You're all still in the upright position. What do you do to prep? What do you do to prep for it? You don't have to tell us your scores. What do you do to prep for it? A lot of practice questions. A lot of practice questions, excellent. I think that is a key. Big key. Because you learn content from practice questions by reading the rationales. You also learn test taking strategies. And there's only so much content. I mean, there's only so many questions you can go through before you start seeing patterns, right? Anybody else besides practice questions? Yeah. Good, and that's what a lot of what we're gonna go through tonight, so. All right, well let's, let's talk for a minute about the NCLEX test plan. Has anybody ever looked at the NCLEX test plan? Good, faculty always do at least. <laughs> right, this is our, honestly, this is our Bible. You know, we wanna graduate students that can pass an exam. I mean, obviously we want you to be able to do more than that, right? We want you to be good communicators, practice ethically, you know, have care, compassion, you know, on and on and on. But bottom line, you have to pass the NCLEX exam as well. And so the NCSBN is the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. Every three years, they do a practice analysis around the country and they determine um, what skills, knowledge, abilities that nurses are using at the bedside. And so every three years, they revise the NCLEX test plan to reflect that. So this is a little bit light. Oh, it's really light, isn't it? You can't even see that other half. Shoot, I'm sorry about that. All right, well, we're not gonna talk a lot about it, but you can see there are five big client need categories there. No, four, I lied, four. Safe and effective care environment, health promotion and maintenance, psychosocial integrity, and physiologic integrity. Those are the big four, four client need categories. Safe and effective environment has two subcategories management of care and safety and infection control. And you'll see physiologic integrity has four subcategories there. Physiologic integrity is the biggest. It has over 51% of the entire NCLEX test plan is driven from physiologic integrity, okay? Why do you care? Well, I would wanna know where to study. This pharmacological and parenteral therapies is the biggest subcategory of physiologic integrity. Why do you think that is? Why is that so heavily emphasized? Just give it a try. Because you can kill someone. Yes, because you can kill someone mm -hmm. with a medication error. Yep. Okay, so that is a big, big one there. Remember that the NCLEX is all about are you a safe, competent, 
beginning nurse, okay? A couple other things just to think about here. Basic care and comfort is a lot of fundamentals. And when I meet with programs and faculty and we look at some of their HESI data, oftentimes we'll see, again, this is just kind of anecdotally, but we'll see lower scores in basic care and comfort. I think that's because students are further away from their fundamentals course, right? You tend to forget things that you're not using all the time. I think you've moved on, right, to complex, really cool, really sick patients, and you forget maybe some of those basics that can be done. So one thing I would suggest, especially for people in here that are nearing the end within a year of the program, is go back and revisit those fundamentals, okay? Any questions on the NCLEX test plan? It's downloadable on the NCSBN's website. It actually gives a lot more uh, detail than this. It, it, ha it provides um, activity statements, which really break down each of those client needs with very specific things that beginning nurses should be able to do safely. So definitely when you get a chance, um, take a look at it. <clears throat> All right, what about Bloom's? I'm sure everybody's heard about Bloom's by now, way back when, created this pyramid of um, kind of thinking, right, and cognitive levels. So just FYI, all of the NCLEX questions are written at the application or higher level. Typically, they are written at the apply, analyze, or evaluate level. Why does that matter? Well, because if you don't understand or remember, you're not gonna apply, analyze, or evaluate. So uh, you've gotta have a really, really firm, I can't say this enough, firm foundation on pathophysiology and pharmacology. Otherwise, it's gonna be really difficult to do those higher level things that are being asked in the question. You know, is your patho a separate course, or do you guys, yeah. And so, that's where I taught it was a separate course as well, but really, again, like every time that you're learning something new in a nursing course, I go back and revisit that pathophysiology, whether it's from a video or something. Because if you can understand what's occurring, my goodness, you can understand what you would expect in terms of signs and symptoms, right? And complications from a disease, and then I bet you could figure out the medical and the nursing care as well if you know the pathophysiology. Okay, so let's, um, let's jump into some test taking strategies. Quickly here, just ingredients of a question. You've got the case event, that's the heart of the question. Um, it can be a little tricky because it can provide relevant as well as irre irrelevant information, kind of a distractor moment, right? Why do I need to know that? Maybe you don't. Uh, the question query is the statement that follows the case event, ask something specific about it. Those two things you might have heard is called the stem of a question, the case event and the query. And then the options are your answer choices. Uh, the correct answer obviously is gonna be there, although sometimes it doesn't feel like that or maybe it feels like there's two correct answers, a lot. Um, but that's because there are distractors placed there. Um, and what it's really a well-written exam will challenge the student who really doesn't know the content well enough and really pull them to choose the wrong answer. And still with the student that knows the information well can apply it, they will, they will choose the correct answer. So exams are written to not really have any outlandish um, answer choice, right? You shouldn't laugh at an answer choice. <laughs> That would, that's a test taking strategy, by the way. If you laugh with the answer choice, it's not right. No, um, so they're written to be where, okay, that is plausible, but that's not the best answer. All right. What about just some general strategies? Um, well, if you've taken any of the standardized exams and when you take the NCLEX, it's one and done, you answer the question, you move on, you can't go back to it. Um, if you think you got it wrong, that's okay, you're gonna get some wrong. Move on, don't let yourself swirl in anxiety like, oh my God, I knew I should have answered, pick that other choice, move on, okay? If you don't know the answer, you can get it down to two, go ahead and guess and move on. But just know on any standardized exam, including the NCLEX, you're gonna come into content that you're unfamiliar with, okay? And you can use some test-taking strategies to try to figure it out, but there might be just some that you just don't know. 
answer, move on. Definitely can try to eliminate options that don't answer the question. Rereading the questions for any qualifiers like highest priority, first, uh, things like that. We'll do some practice questions to um, show, show you those. Look to see if are there responses that are different from each other. If there are really similar responses, maybe they're not correct and you can go ahead and eliminate those. The other thing that I think is just tricky and what I had a lot of students would come to me when they were struggling, well, I chose that answer because it was check the airway. Okay, but that's not what the question was asking. So that's where it can get kind of tricky too. The option could be correct, but it's not answering the question. Any questions on general strategies? Okay, some other kind of essential steps when you're breaking down a question. And by the way, we're just focusing on traditional type of questions tonight, whether that's multiple choice or multi, uh, select all out of five. Uh, we decided the NGN, NGN items are great, uh, but probably wouldn't lend itself to an hour. So uh, maybe I'll come back and do some NGN if, if anybody's interested. So I like the NGN. What do you guys think of the NGN questions? The unfolding case studies, the trend items, you like them? Yeah. You don't like them? You like them? I think they flow a lot better. I do too. You know, you're not jumping from one subject to the next. You know, you're not right. cardiac and then jump asking somebody's toes. You know, they, <laughs> right. They, they We're talking about them. quality improvement of project of some sort. Yeah, it moves straight in a line. Yeah. So for anybody that hasn't taken one of the tests yet, um, the next generation is about 20% of the NCLEX, and uh, that's gonna be about 20% of any of the standardized exams you take now. We'll have NGN integration, and what it is, it's, real, it's realistic patient data. So unfolding case study with six questions attached, and, um, and then some other types of NGN. But I kinda like it because you don't have to really read into the question too much, right? It's here's the data, now you've gotta recognize cues and prioritize and so forth. So we are seeing overall, just uh, from around the country, pretty good results from the May graduates who, who are the first cohorts to take the new NGN exam. I think everybody was really shaken in their boots because of, I mean, COVID and some people's schools were shut down, you know, all of that. And we're actually seeing better results. Now, partial scoring might be contributing <laughs> to that. You probably heard that, right? So. Um, the NCLEX is now being partially scored. All of the NGN items, or most of them, um, partial credit. And then on the, multi, on the select all that apply for the traditional NCLEX items, some of those also you get partial credit for. So how nice is that? Yeah. Okay, uh, some other things. You gotta determine if the style of the question is positive or negative. We're gonna do a couple of practice ones with those. Um, gotta find the keywords in the question. I find it helpful to rephrase the question in your own words and then answer the question, and then also rule out some options. Here's a question that is positively worded. So which interventions apply in the care of an infant after a cleft lip repair? Read through those. Read through those options. This is a select all that apply, okay? When you're looking at the question, what are the key words in the question? After. After a cleft lip repair. So after a surgical procedure, of, after a cleft lip repair. And there's one other keyword there. Interventions, I heard you say that. Okay, so we're looking for interventions um, after a cleft lip repair. So I want you to visualize each answer choice and think about its effect uh, on the surgical repair. A, position the child on the abdomen. Would you do that? No, I mean, why would you put somebody prone on their belly after they've had a cleft lip repair, right? You wanna protect, so if you know the basics of, of periop, right? Whether you know anything about 
cleft lip, you would know you wouldn't want to put pressure on that surgical site. A's out. Observe for bleeding at the operative site. Reasonable. That's a basics of operative nursing, right? Keep elbow, elbow restraints on the infant at all times. What word don't you like there? All. Oh, good. That's one you can eliminate right away. Cleanse the suture line gently after feeding the infant. I would, right? You want to keep a surgical site clean, right? And non, you know, some basics of surgical care, right? Are um, prevention of infection, prevention of bleeding or monitoring for bleeding, protecting the site. Initiate measures that will prevent vigorous and sustained crying. Yeah, I see some nods. Yes, you don't want uh, trauma to that site, right? Assist the mother with breastfeeding if this is the feeding method of choice. Reasonable. Nutrition is a big piece of surgical re of healing, right? Okay, so you got that one right. B, D, E, and F. You think you could have gotten that one? Okay. What about... This one is a negatively worded question. You probably all have seen a question like this before. Our brains don't like to work in the negative, by the way, okay? Um, the nurse is collecting data from a client who has been taking a meprazole as prescribed. The nurse determines that the medication is ineffective if the client continues to experience which symptom? So you'll have to stop for a minute and think, okay, this question is a negatively, not in a sense of like I'm putting you down, but it's just a negative query type of question. So you have to kind of flip that around a little bit and think, how does this medication work? What is a meprazole? Very good. It's a gastric, yeah, a gastric um, acid pump inhibitor, those things ending in C-O-L-E. Again, things that you probably are going to need to memorize are some drug classifications. Um, and so how do we, the nurse determines that the medication is ineffective, the client continues to experience B heartburn. All right. A couple some more kind of test taking strategies. Don't fall into the what if syndrome, okay? Yeah, that's reading into the question. Read the question and just go with what is in the question. Try to picture yourself, um, the situation in your mind, like we did with that first one, of kind of visualizing caring for a child with a cleft lip repair. Assume you have all the resources needed. You're at the NCLEX hospital. You have all the resources. You have all the supplies. You have all the people that you need for this scenario. Okay. Couple of other things, just about appropriate knowledge. Um, do not respond, and I hesitate to put this on there based on your past client care experiences or agency. Now, you might be thinking, why am I doing clinical then? <laughs> but or, <laughs> clinical is an invaluable experience. However, sometimes things in the clinical setting are not like the NCLEX hospital is. So definitely draw on your knowledge of what you're doing there, but just be careful of how you're using it, okay? Um, don't respond based on what you think is realistic. Definitely don't respond on, well, grandma and grandpa died of heart failure and they had, you know, A, B, C, and D, but children, pregnancies, parents, personal responses to a drug and so forth. What can you, you know, use appropriate knowledge and respond ABCs and all those things listed there. And we're gonna talk about several of those tonight and do some practice questions with them. I know I would guess some faculty probably tell you you don't need to memorize, right? You're not gonna be successful if you're just simply memorizing. I agree with that, but there are some things that you probably just are better off to memorize, a few things, okay? Those are listed up there. Growth and developmental milestones. When does a baby sit up unassisted? When do they start babbling? When does their anterior fontanelle close? Right, some of those things are just probably easier to memorize. 
And if you don't have children, I think it's even harder with those developmental milestones. And it's based on a typical child. Every parent thinks they have super child. It's just based on a typical average child. Crisis intervention, somebody that's at risk for suicide. Okay, those are just steps and things that you probably ought to memorize on what to do. Lab values, now the NCLEX is providing reference ranges now for lab values on both the NGN and on the traditional type of question. So do you want to memorize lab values? Perhaps not, but you probably want to know what's reasonable, right? So like, well, first of all, if somebody's in chronic kidney failure, they're going to have a high BUN and creatinine. So you have to know the pathophysiology that yes, it's, I, I have the reference ranges, yes, it is elevated, but I don't care that much because it's expected. So you still have to know what's expected and what becomes a complication in terms of lab, abnormal lab values. Drug classifications, I would just memorize those, you know, with the endings on them, know the class, um, the mechanism of action, the side effects, and the patient teaching, contraindications and patient teaching. Immunizations, I don't know how, but just memorizing those. Uh, stages of death and dying, teaching and learning. Teaching and learning is huge on the NCLEX, by the way. Okay, so it is actually an integrated process on the NCLEX test plan. You know, I showed you those client needs. There's like eight integrated processes that are threaded throughout all of the client needs, and one of them is teaching and learning. So, you know, really the principles of, of teaching, how learners learn, but also then, of course, what we're teaching patients um, and families. Stages of pregnancy and fetal growth, and then really just knowing scope of practice from your uh, board of nursing. Um, delegation, assignment making, prioritizing those kind of things and those definitions. Okay, let's talk about how to use some specific strategies. Uh, we'll call them priority setting frameworks. So if you can kind of use some of these frameworks, I think you'll become better test takers. Uh, you're not going to use all of them in one question, but you definitely can use one here or there in different questions and really strategize. I think improve your clinical judgment, but also improve probably your test taking. Everybody, that didn't show up, I'm sorry, but every, thank God everybody's heard of Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, right? Um, you gotta meet the basic physiological needs first. Everybody's heard about that. Nobody cares about spiritual well-being if you don't have an airway. So these are always first. If there's nothing that you, that if everything has been addressed here, then jump to safety as your next option, okay? So, you know, when there's a priority question, it's not gonna be those top ones that you're gonna choose. And we've got a couple questions on that. Okay, what if you've never seen bipolar disorder or ever heard about it? Just see if you can answer this question. A nurse is planning care for a client who has bipolar disorder and is experiencing an acute manic episode. Which of the following is the highest priority intervention the nurse should include in the plan of care? When you see this type of question, highest priority, all of those answer choices are appropriate. All of those are things that you would do in the care of a person with manic depressive disorder, okay? You have to choose which one is the most important or the highest priority, so you could use probably Maslow's here. So when you read through those, and you know highest priority, you know all of them are correct, what's gonna be your highest priority? B, nutrition. Nutrition is in the bottom of that pyramid, right? All of those other ones, yeah, we use simple directions for patients with bipolar, they can't have a whole bunch of directions coming out on, they're not gonna be able to follow them. That is correct, certainly, Kind of getting the, the client or the patient kind of decreased stimuli is definitely important. They tend to give all of their valuables away. And so keeping their things locked in a, you know, is, is appropriate. But none of those are as high a priority as they forget to eat or they're too busy to eat. And they're burning off a lot of calories with the, as much as they're moving. So um, high calorie foods and fluids. You think you could answer that even if you didn't know about manic depressive? I bet. Maybe you could. 
Okay, you can also use a nursing process to help you answer questions. Um, it's definitely a test taking strategy. Here are the steps of the nursing process. We're not doing away with the nursing process. The clinical judgment measurement model is definitely adds on, I think, and builds to the nursing process. Um, but the nursing process is still here and is still important. Um, everybody knows the five steps there. Typically, in a question where you're using this, you assess first as a strategy to use, unless the patient's life is being threatened, right? Unless they have a life-threatening uh, issue going on, you're not gonna assess, you're actually gonna do something. But, but when you've got a question like that, you can maybe use the nursing process as a strategy. So let's take a look here. Client has not had a bowel movement in two days and reports this information to the nurse. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? Talk about how you would answer that. How, anybody want to work through that out loud? I'll give you a prize. Mm -hmm. The question says which intervention should be first in the first step. Good. All right. That is the correct answer. A couple other things to consider. So you get a prize. A couple other things to consider is uh, instruct and instruct. A and D are kind of similar. So, well, plus D is just not correct. We're going to use more than five eight ounce glasses per day, but they are kind of similar. So you could knock those two out. Typically, the NCLEX tests for what you can do as a nurse, not calling the healthcare provider. I'm not saying always. There are times that you notify the healthcare provider. But typically, the NCLEX wants to test on what you're going to do, okay? And then the other piece, that strategy is, I'm going to assess first. I have no idea. Like, maybe this person only has a bowel movement every other day. I don't know. But I'm going to do the assessment first so I know what is usual for the patient. All right, next one. Nurse is caring for an adolescent who's undergoing an open reduction in internal fixation of the ankle following a sports injury. The client is extremely anxious, having difficulty sleeping. Which of the following is the priority intervention? Again, you're looking at this and all of these are appropriate and something that you would wanna try. But what would be the first thing you would wanna do? Provide dim lighting in the client's room. Allow the client's family to spend the night with them. Offer music as a distraction. Ask the client to tell you what he knows about the procedure. Good, assess, right? Determining the understanding um, of the procedure. What does he know about the procedure? Uh, then you can provide information, right? So that assessment piece is first. It's also one of those principles of teaching and learning as well. How about good old ABCs? So this is uh, a framework, um, always the priority for initial assessments when the client's life is at stake. You know in CPR that you do CAB and acute before chronic. Nurses caring for a client who is wheezing and gasping for breath just after receiving a dose of amoxicillin. Which of the following actions is the nurse, nurse's priority? Somebody wheezing, gasping. What do you think is going on here when you're reading the signs and symptoms? Anaphylaxis. Yeah, they're having an anaphylactic reaction to amoxicillin. <clears throat> and so, I mean, good God, B, I mean, t uh, knock out B right away, right? <laughs> okay? He doesn't want, re he or she doesn't want reassurance. Um, they can't breathe right now. So knock out B, and you're down to A, C, and D. They're all correct. What would you do first? What's going to work the fastest on what's actually going on? Let's go with A. A, good. Yeah, I think that's kind of a hard one. Yeah, administer epinephrine, right? That's going to counteract the bronchoconstriction that's occurring. I kind of wanted to go to D. I kind of wanted to go to D. I would have started fluids soon, but not right away. Um, 
but you know what, who cares what they're doing on the cardiac monitor if they don't get the drug first, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, administer epinephrine. Okay, a few more test-taking strategies here. So, in general, I don't want to say 100%, I hate to box myself in like that, perform the least invasive intervention first. That is a test-taking strategy. We've talked about assess before taking action unless the client is immediately dying and has an airway or breathing circulation problem, then you don't assess, you act. Treat the client, not the machine. Typically, you wanna gather information and perform relevant actions before you call the healthcare provider. Unless, again, the life is at stake of the client. For example, I've seen questions before where you just received a client in the recovery room after a tonsillectomy. And I don't know, I forget how it's worded, but you notice that they are bleeding everywhere. And your answer choice is to call the healthcare provider. They need to be returned back to the OR, okay? So their life is at stake there. But in general, you're gonna to wanna to gather information before you call the healthcare provider. Determine which client to assess first. So think most at risk, most physiologically unstable. That's gonna be your pathophysiology coming. Uh, always follow guidelines for delegating assignments. So there's delegation questions on here. Know the role of the RN versus the PN versus the UAP or the PCA, whatever. I think, I think I see more unlicensed assistive personnel. The other thing to remember with delegation type of questions is make the best use of your resources. So if you have some different skill, some different care that you're delegating out, have the PN do, you know, the subcutaneous injection, the PO meds, the dressing change, but have the UAP do the bath and, and that kind of thing. So use the best, use your resources um, in the best possible way. A client who has chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease, COPD, is resting in a semi fowlers position with oxygen at two liters per minute for nasal cannula. The client develops dyspnea. Which action should the nurse, nurse take first? So your keywords here are what? What are the keywords in the questions? That's, yep, semi fowler's position. So they're, what, about 45 degrees or so? 35, 45 degrees. And then a second piece of that is? Dyspnea. Dyspnea, yeah. And then first, what do you do first? So all of these, again, are potentially appropriate responses. We typically know calling the healthcare provider, you're gonna do something first, right before, so we can knock out A. Good. Excellent. Least invasive procedure first. Very good. Would you guys have gotten that one? You guys are smart. <laughs> the mugs are coming out. Okay. Let's try again here. Another one. Nurse is caring for a client who gave birth eight hours ago. Client reports feeling weak and dizzy. The nurse notes that the client's perineal pad is soaked with blood. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? Good. <laughs> you know that one. Who said that? Really fast. Excellent. Okay. You guys are good. All of them, um, all of them are things you're going to want to do. And if you haven't had um, women's health yet, that's okay. Um, you'll get to this content. But those are all things that you're going to do. Massaging the fundus, though, is going to be the least invasive and the quickest, and you might be able to get that uterus to contract and contract down and stop bleeding. So that'd be the first least invasive thing you can do. All right, let's talk about some more kind of strategies here when you're answering questions. Okay, acute versus chronic. Probably not a big surprise you're gonna address acute problems before chronic problems, right? So that sort of does become um, really important to know the expected findings of a disease. Like the expected findings of COPD, I'm not terribly concerned about, but when there's a complication or a worsening or an exacerbation of COPD, 
then I am concerned. All right, so knowing the expected um, versus complications is important to know with disease process. Unstable versus stable. Obviously, unstable patients pose a greater risk or threat than stable patients. They need to receive care first. You can use those, and sometimes those are keywords in a question. And then urgent versus not urgent. Urgent needs pose a greater threat. So let's practice a couple here. Nurses receiving a handoff report at the beginning of the shift from four clients. Which of the following clients should the nurse assess first? A client who has macular degeneration does not want to take his medication. Is that a priority? If you didn't even look at the other three. Now, that is a chronic disease. At some point, I'm going to want to follow up with that person and ask, you know, why are, you know, let's talk about why you don't want to take meds. But that's a chronic disease that has developed over years. Client who has taken insulin has an A1C of 7%. Are you going to get a crash card? No, you're not. An A1C of 7% is elevated, but it's a three month look at your control of your blood sugars. Okay, so I'm not, I mean, yes, they need to, right, anyway, Bill needs some attention, but not right now. A client with Graves, Graves disease and it has exophthalmus. Eye bulging. Expected. A client who's taking digoxin is experiencing anorexia. Very good, toxicity right up here in the front. Okay, yeah, so that's gonna be your nurse that you're gonna assess first. They are the most unstable. Would you have gotten that one? Well, but you guys are young in the program, right? That's definitely a med surge question. It is right? definitely a med surge question. So don't feel bad question. about that. Don't feel, you're not gonna, no. right. Just, I think just kind of soaking in some of the general principles might help as you move through. Yeah. The other thing, I don't even really know, digoxin. I had no flipping idea about this. No idea. My mind would go to that medication. And is that a side effect or is that a sign of toxicity? So if I had no idea, I might still want to choose D. Okay. Nurses reviewing laboratory data for four clients. Which of the following clients should the nurse assess first? A client who has atherosclerosis with a total cholesterol level of 250. Is that an emergency? Or is that a major problem? I'm probably walking around with a cholesterol right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. It's, it's, it's abnormally high. It's not typically a priority, okay? A client who has chronic kidney disease with a B1 of A. It's expected, yeah. That's where pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease is gonna be really helpful to know. Client who's receiving warfarin with an IRN of 4.0, INR of 4.0. That's not good because it's, it's, it's elevated, right? Yeah, it's way elevated. That's, um, and warfarin, Coumadin is a blood thinner, right? So they have a potential now for bleeding. You can make ABCs here. So if we're thinking probably C, right? But let's just take a look at D. Client who's receiving furosemide has a serum potassium of 3.8. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna monitor that one because they're taking furosemide and they have potassium of 3.8, but it's not a potassium of 2.8. Right? Don't read into it. It's 3.8. I'm going to go with the patient who's a risk for bleeding now with an uh, elevated or increased IR. Okay. Nurses caring for a client who has peripheral arterial disease. This is kind of a chronic versus acute strategy here. Which of the following should the nurse report to the provider immediately? So all of these are findings with peripheral arterial disease, but this is asking you which chronic findings of PAD and which one is an acute complication. You would know it? No, I, I read it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? She said she read it wrong. 
Oh, okay. No, you didn't. Well, I was saying. C. Okay. You got it. Actually, did. <laughs> all, all of the other ones are. Um, all of the other ones are. Compl or expected findings, right? I mean, they're abnormal. Um, but when you don't have a pulse in your foot, where you previously had one, that's a problem because you don't have blood flow anymore. So ABCs. Okay. I don't have a magic formula for anxiety. If I did, I'd be rich. I did work with a lot of students that had high levels of anxiety. I was never very good with it. Um, my best strategy for them was to tell them to over-prepare. I, I mean, that sounds lame. But I didn't know what else to say, right? Besides more that you over-prepare, and then you tell yourself, I've done all I can. I cannot do any more than this. I, have, I can say honestly to myself that this has been the priority in my life, and I have studied my butt off, and I have worked my butt off, and that's all I can do. So kind of manage your self-talk that way. Um, I would definitely, if you haven't already, nursing school requires a schedule. It's a full-time job for the most part. I know you guys are probably, some of you are working, I get it. But um, it's tough to work a whole lot and do well in nursing school without losing your mind. So um, definitely set up a study schedule. You don't have much of a life for two or four years, however long you're in this program. Just keep the end goal in mind that you'll have a life a little bit later on, but for right now you don't have much of one. Um, taking care of yourself as much as possible with, with meals and sleep and um, you know exercise and um, think about all those people that have become nurses. That's what I always told myself. If they can be a nurse, I can be a nurse. So what I'm saying is like, <laughs> there's a lot of nurses out there. So that, that sounded really mean. I didn't mean it like that. No. But I just meant like, there's a lot of nurses out there. You can do this. Right. It just takes a lot of commitment. But it's very doable and achievable. So, OK, what questions do you have? Did you learn anything new? Guys, I have a dosage book. Somebody ask a question. I have five minutes left. Anybody have a question? If I ask a question, I get a book. Yeah, you get that book right there. Do you have a book? <laughs> no, it's not. Do you only have one? I only have one. Come up with a question. How are you? No. <laughs> ask a relevant question. Yeah, I think I've heard of that. I've heard of some of the other ones that you can purchase. Generally, I told students you have paid enough for all the resources you have. I would use what you have. Um, I think some students were purchasing because I think they, again, I'm probably psychoanalyzing, like they were like trying to like, the more that I have at my fingertips, surely the better I'm gonna be and do. Um, but typically, I think, I would guess you guys have a lot of resources here already um, that they we, have. We have your old Saunders book. Like well, the, Saunders uh, is good. Like there's, there are probably 4,000 questions At online, yeah. like in a bank. And you can, you can have it set to not get any new questions, or not get any old questions. Like any ones you've answered, it can keep those to itself. Yeah. So. Between that and the adaptive quizzing, I'm not sure how much more. The only thing I did tell some students, like, do you guys do like a live review at the end of the program, yeah. like an NCLEX review? Mm -hmm. Occasionally, if I had a student that was kind of at risk, I just said, you might want to do an additional review course somewhere. Um, but typically, I did not have students, I did not recommend to students to go out and buy additional things. What other questions? Yeah. So um, I know you said and focus a lot about like on pathophysiology mm -hmm. and all that stuff, but since uh, some of us here are in a fundamentals course, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had that uh, content yet. What mm -hmm. would you say we should focus on the standardized test for fundamentals specifically? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Safety, safety, safety on fundamentals. So um, if you look at the NCLEX test plan, it'll be like home safety. It'll be emergency, um, like, it's so silly. I didn't even realize it was on the fundamentals, but like, um, 
kind of like fire safety is kind of fundamentals, yeah. people believe it. Ergonomic principles, so like body mechanics. Um, I could go on and on. In terms of kind of patho, I mean like principles of constipation and bowel patterns and urinary patterns are on there. Atelectasis would be something you want to look at. Fluid and electrolytes, and not in the context of like, you know, fluid and electrolytes works better in the context of a disease, right? But knowing the principles, that's a hard one. Fluid and electrolytes you're gonna see on the fundamentals. Um, knowing the skills, and I don't just mean like step-by-step -step skills, but this sounds silly, but know how, how, know how to uh, instruct clients on how to use crutches, canes, walkers, how to use assistive devices, safe use of equipment, um, sleep. So teaching patients on what to avoid, what not to avoid, how to get the best night's sleep. Uh, sensory alterations, yeah, blindness, deafness, hard of hearing. Health assessment's gonna be on that as well, so know your assessment pieces of things. Well, and that's what I, I have the back row in class right now. Okay. And I've been trying to tell them to zoom out a little bit in mm -hmm. terms of HESI. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you agree with that advice. Mm -hmm. More generalized concepts yeah. of safety and yes. body Fundamentals is more generalized for sure. And that's it, hard to tell you to study. Like, yes, it is. Except <laughs> what book are you using? Taylor's. Okay, so Taylor, you know, you're probably covering the most important chapters in Taylor. That's what I would be studying, right? Some of those other chapters, I mean, it's a big book, right? Most of them are. We don't cover that. every chapter. Yeah, so don't worry about those chapters that aren't being covered, but there's big safety ones, bowel elimination, urinary elimination, fluid electrolytes, sleep, stress, grief and loss is in there. Patient teaching and education is huge on a fundamentals exam. Um, there's just a little bit of cardiopulmonary on there, like a postural hypertension, hypotension, atelectasis, post-op, those kind of things. But yeah, it's a little bit more general, you're right. What other questions? Well, thank you for inviting me down here, over here. I'm from Cincinnati, I don't know if I told you that. Um, my beloved Bengals. <laughs> it's a sad day on Sunday. Um, Anyway, um, I'm going to make it home tonight. <laughs>